Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to this Archer uh, virtual tutorial. Uh, the topic today is going to be um, about make, um, and I'll describe what make is and um, and how to use it. And I've got some real life examples. Actually, if you look on the Archer website, there's um, a source code, a tar file, I'll explain this a bit later. So you should be able to download everything that I'm working on today. I'll not be doing this on Archer, I'll just be doing it on my laptop, but everything with a couple of tiny changes, everything applies to Archer. So make and compilation. Just to say all this material is, is could be reused under the normal um, Creative Commons um, non-commercial uh, attribution license. So you're welcome to, 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 to use this yourself. So the reason I wanted to give a, a, a tutorial on make is because um, make is, is quite fundamental to the way that a lot of uh, large applications are built. But it's one of these. As, as I hope I sort of alluded to in the title, it's one of these programs which is a, seems to have some mysticism, mystique surrounding it. And uh, make files can become very, very complicated, but fundamentally, it's a very, very simple uh, idea. Um, and in certain places, it's not particularly simply implemented. The ideas and concepts are very, very simple. So I thought it'd be useful to do a few simple examples and explain what's going on. This is very much my view as a user of Make. If I say anything that's technically incorrect or wrong, please, please flag it up if you know it's wrong. But this is really what I've learned from using Make over the years and, and the kind of ticks and trips and I can't say it, the hints and tips I can give you. So just to reiterate, you know, Compiling a simple code may be easy. You write a little program, you compile it explicitly. Compile it, produce program.exe from program.c. But even anything but the most simple programs have more than one source file. So you have three source files, file one, file two, and file three. So that's wasteful to do that single compilation there. If you do cc minus o program.exe, file one, file two, file three.c, all of those files are recompiled every time to produce the program. But when you edit one, you might only edit one of them, like file two or file three. So it's actually this, this particular line here is wasteful, and it's much better to compile independently. So what we do is we compile files independently, cc minus c, and the same in Fortran, um, to, to produce um, object files, which are effectively pre-compiled files, which can be linked together, and then we link the object files together. So that's the way that you should, obviously, the way you should attack um, many programs made from many files. You compile the files independently just to waste, so you don't waste lots of time recompiling things that don't need to be recompiled, and then you link them together. But then there are problems, okay? What if I change file to what C? Well, then I have to remember to cc minus c file 2.c to recompile it and then relink. But that's error prone. It's error prone because uh, maybe I change more than file two. Maybe I change file three as well, in which case I've got now got an executable which doesn't correspond to my source files. Or maybe I'm retyping stuff and I can make an, uh, a mistake. So you could say, let's be safe. Every time we recompile, we, we remove all the files, rm star dot o, recompile them all individually and then link them, but that's wasteful again. So there are even more problems. Um, source files often depend on other files. And the classic thing is in, in C, a source file will include a header file. I'll come back to the way that Fortran works with module files later on. So I, 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 uh, many of my source files might include in, um, a file called include3.h. So I edit that. How do I know which files to recompile? So recompiling all the files is slow and probably unnecessary, but failing to recompile a file is disastrous. As I said, the, the most difficult bug to, to, um, to, to find out, the most difficult bug to uncover, is a bug where your program does not reflect the current source code, where you're looking at a .c file on the screen, but you've forgotten to recompile it, so the executable doesn't correspond to the text in the file. Then debugging is impossible. So what we want is a tool which remembers the dependencies between files, i.e. it says that, well, file3.c depends on include3.h, i.e. if I change include3.h, um, uh, include I need to recompile file3.c. It recompiles all files that need to be updated, but it only recompiles those files that need to be updated. It recompiles the minimum number of files. And something which I've not said here, which is kind of underlying all of this, there's a lot of 
hidden information in how you build a big program, what options you use for which files, what order you compile them in, and all that it would be nice to write down and, and document. So a program, a large application, is not defined purely by its source files. There's meta information like how they fit together, how should it be compiled. And we need a tool which remembers that. You do it once correctly, and then you write it down, and it's stored there forever. So what enter make? Make is a tool which allows you to do um, two things, really. It allows you to specify pairwise dependencies between files. And I'll come back to that as to how that, what ramifications that has. But what you say things like is program 2.0 depends on program 2.c. Okay, so you tell the make tool through something called a make file that this this particular dot o depends on dot c now it'll turn out that we tend to use make for compiling um programs c programs fortran programs c plus plus programs but actually make doesn't depend on that make is a completely general tool so you tell make that two files have a dependency on one of them so program 2.c might depend on include 3.h that's saying if if include 3.h um, changes you have to do you have to re-update program 2.c now, although you specify only pairwise dependencies, make works out the entire dependency tree. So in this example, it knows if you if you change include 3.h, it has to uh, uh, it, and you want to and you want to recreate program 2.0, it knows include 3.h um, requires an updated program 2.c, which requires an updated program 2.0. It, 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 you only specify pairwise dependencies, but make works out the entire dependency tree. So that's something which make is doing you for, 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 um, um, for free. So the user specifies pairwise, and as, so as well as specifying what depends on what, which are the dependencies, you specify rules for resolving dependencies, and again, pairwise rules. So you said that program 2.0 depends on program 2.c, which says that if program 2.c is updated, program 2.0 needs to be updated. So you're going to update program 2.c by running an editor on it. But, but how does make know how to update program 2.0? Well, you give rules for resolving dependencies. And so you would tell make, well, to update program 2.0, depending on program 2.c, you have to run the C compiler on program 2.c. So you, you, you uh, specify pairwise dependencies and rules for resolving those dependencies. And all this information is stored in the make file. So you tell make what depends on what, and you tell that how to update the files. But fundamentally, how does make, how can you have any tool which knows when to update things? It all depends on dates. So how does make know when to update? Make compares the date stamps of files. So when you run the make tool, and we'll see this um, later on, what it does, it looks at all the files which you've told it to look at. It looks at them knowing what the dependencies are. And if it says program 2.0 depends on program 2.c, it looks at the date stamps. And if program 2.c is more recent than program 2.0, then there's a problem and we need to resolve that dependency by running whatever rule relates those two files together. So make is a way of specifying pairwise dependencies, rules for resolving those dependencies, which are often running a compiler, but we'll see if they can be more general than that. And make looks at the date stamps of files. So those are the important things about make. And we store these things in a make file. So I decided to do an example which wasn't programming, and I decided to do something where based around a family. So I've created three types of file. My name's David, and I have david.self, day.parent, and david.child. And these will have date stamps on them. And the tendencies are self has to be younger than the parent, because it has to be created more recently, and child is younger than self. So that those are the dependencies. And I've used age here as a, as a way of sort of um, relating to date stamps. There's also an output file called David Family, which, which creates a list, which is, which is a listing of all the current files. But I'll, I'll come back to that. That's not so important. So, so my dependencies are fairly obvious. Self is younger than parent and child is younger than self. However, what's the update rule? Well, the update rule I'm just going to use is a copy. It's kind of asexual reproduction. So that if my child is, is, is older, than, um, th than myself, then the way to resolve that is to copy myself, copy david.self to david.child, or the equivalent rule would be to copy david.parent to david.self. So I've deliberately used a non-programming rule here um, because uh, I think it's, it's going to hopefully illustrate, um, make us think a bit more about what's really going on. And I'll come back later to how it applies to programming towards the end. So I'm now going to move to um, 
a window where I'll, I've done. Now you'll see on the website, hopefully, where you access this tutorial, that there are um, that there's some source code. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to um, work on that source code. So hopefully, I'm going to pick the right one. Okay. So hopefully here now. I have downloaded um, the um, the code from the um, actually downloaded it from the website and it's called um, virtualmake.tar and I'll actually just remove what's there just to show that I'm being completely kosher. The way to unpack this file, I'm trying to rearrange my windows slightly. The way to unpack this file is to use the tar command tar xvf virtualmake.tar. So now that unpacks it all. So it creates a directory called virtual make, which I'll go into. And in there, there are three exercises, three subdirectories, family one, family two, and traffic. Now, family one and family two are, the, the, are these examples I'm going to go look at uh, immediately later on. Traffic is a, a, C, a C and Fortran code, but I'll go into family one. If you see, there are these um, there are these three files there, uh, four files. There are the, the actual files I want to work on, David Child, David Parent, and David Self, and the make file. So let's look at the make file to start with. The make file has got to tell, um, has got to encapsulate two things. It has to say what files depend on what, and it has to give a resolution rule. And the way that make does that is you have um, you separate the two file names for the colon. So this statement, david.child colon david.self, says that the child file depends on the self file. And immediately under that, you put the resolution rule. So if the child file is, is older than the self file, which is not possible, um, given the, the way that um, the parent and, and, and uh, myself and the child flow down, I copy david.self to david.child. Similarly, david.self depends on david.parent. And if that's if the date order is wrong, we copy david.parent to david.self. This final file, david.family, as I said, this this is just a, a listing of all the um, all the files in the current directory in reverse date order. So that depends on all the constituent files, david.self, david.child, and david.parent. And I do ls minus lrt david.style into david david family. So that's just a um, um, uh, a little rule at the end. And the way I've, um, I don't want to jump ahead, but the, this is supposed to kind of mimic how uh, a .c file depends on a, a .o file depends on a .c file, and this is, but which is the compilation step, and this is supposed to mimic the linking step, where you link together lots of files. So this is supposed to mimic compilation, and this is supposed to mimic linking. So if we look, I'll just clear the screen. If we look at the files, um, there's something wrong here because if you look, um, the order is parent, child, self instead of parent self child so if i type make david dot child that's saying i want to create david dot child and the make file should spot that there's a problem um and um it should it should do that copy david dot self david dot child so what i said was i want to make david dot child says please could you update and create david dot child correctly and it noticed that the child um, was older than myself, and it resolved that by copying. Okay. If I try and do it again, makes clever, and it says, "Well, I don't need to do anything." So David Dot Child is up to date. So what Make did is it spotted that the dependency that I've explicitly stated in the Make file was was not was not um, uh, being conformed to, and applied the resolution rule. If I do Make David Family, it will do the thing which I I wanted it to do, which is it will ls minus lrt david dot up david family so if i look at that file that 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 um that file now exists so actually there's two slightly different things going on when i did make david dot child it noticed that david dot child was out of date with respect to david dot self and did the update rule when i did make david family it noticed that david family didn't exist at all but it does the same thing it creates it by applying the rule and if i do make david family again it will notice that David family is up to date. Now, um, the the interesting point is is if I um, if I if I update David dot parent, 
Now the parent is, if I look, now the parent is, is, is the newest file, which is completely wrong. If I do make david.child, we see that, that make has understood that there's, that there's a kind of a chain effect here, okay? So I have not actually said anywhere in the make file that the child um, depends on the parent. If we look at the, at the, at the make file, I say the ch child depends on myself and myself depends on the parent. But when I updated, um, uh, when I updated, um, we can't see it here, I've lost some of the history, so I'll do it again just for the recording. If I Emacs, if I edit the, all I'm doing is by editing these files, I'm just, I'm just adding or subtracting something, it's just to update the date on it. If I now do make David dot child, make understands that David child depends on David self, but David self needs to be updated because of the parent. So make has taken these pairwise rules, stitched them together and created this dependency tree. Um, and it should, it should also notice now if I do make David family, it should notice that this is out of date and it will recreate it all. The final one is it can, un it can unravel it all the way. So if I update, again, the parent, and do make David family, it should notice, it should, it should realize it has to do the whole thing from top to bottom, that David family, uh, that David parent has, has now a, a, a repercussions on David child, uh, sorry, on David self, which has repercussions on David child, which has repercussions on David family. And so by touching the, the root, by updating the root file in this, in this family tree, it, it noticed that to, to recreate the whole tree, it had to update everything. So hopefully that, I mean, you maybe want to go and play around that yourself, but hopefully that, that's illustrated the, these two basic concepts that the make file encapsulates the dependencies between, pet, or three basic concepts. Make file encapsulates the dependencies between pairs of files based on date. It also encapsulates how to update files if that date ordering is wrong or if the file doesn't exist. And thirdly, that you only specify pairwise dependencies that make unravels the whole tree. So I'm going to go back to the um, the presentation and so what you may have thought about that make file is oh that's really all very good but it's very very verbose okay so. Um, we're going to go to an example called Family Two, which illustrates more in reality how you use um, how you use uh, make files. Uh, I'm going to say the typo though, which is a bit embarrassing. Apologies for that. So the way we wrote the the first uh, make file in Family One would would correspond to having a make file for a program which can comprise C files of saying file one dot O depends on file one dot C, CC minus C file one dot C. File two dot O depends on file two dot C, CC minus C file dot two dot C. So this is clearly not really much better than doing it by hand. This is very, very verbose. The point about computers is they're supposed to take simple rules and apply them in many places. You don't say, if you're writing a technical program, uh, A1 equals A1 plus B1, uh, A2 equals A2 plus B2, A3 equals A3 plus B3, use a for or a do loop to automate that. So we would really like make to understand more generically, not that just file one dot O depends on file one dot C, but that generically dot O files depend on dot C files. So I've called these generic rules. I couldn't actually guarantee that's the official terminology for me, but I call them generic rules and they're based on the suffix. So in Unix, um, uh, we, we, we illustrate, we, we denote what type of file something is by its suffix. A, a C file is .C, a Fortran file is .F90. And so make also allows you not just to specify explicit rules, but also generic rules saying .C file, .O files depend on .C files. So what I'm going to do to try and illustrate that is I'm going to have two family trees, one for David and one for Sally. So yeah, so I'll go back to that example right now. Now, I'll just slightly clunk the way I'm doing this. Apologies, I'm having to uh, reshare uh, for sort of technical reasons. Um, so hopefully now we go on to the other direction, which I've called family two. 
And you'll see there um, that we have a bunch of files. We have our, our, our old friend, the make file. But if we look, we have a family tree of my, from me, david.parent, david.child, and david.self, but also a family tree for Sally, who's a friend of mine, sally.parent, sally.child, and sally.self. So how are we going to uh, uh, encapsulate the dependencies of the David files and the Sally files in a reasonably um, um, succinct manner? So this is the make file. Now, this is where I have to admit, make is a very, very old tool. And the syntax of make, what make does is fundamentally quite simple, but very flexible and powerful. But the syntax of make files is pretty horrible. But that's why I wanted to give you examples to show, show, show what's going on. Now, the first thing we have to tell make is, look, we're going to be worried about suffixes on files. Now, you don't normally have to do this with make files because make understands, make has a few generic built-in rules. It knows about C files and Fortran files, but it's never heard of parent, self, and child files parent, self, and child files. This magic syntax says, look, I'm going to widen this make file about dot parent, dot self, and dot child files. And then we have a, a rule which is sort of similar to our previous rule of, say, David dot child depends on David dot self. But it's a generic rule. It says that dot self and dot child files are related. And the syntax is slightly reversed. This dot self dot child is that child files, dot child files, depend on dot self files. So that's the dependency. So this is a generic rule. It's saying that Fred dot child depends on Fred dot self. Um, William dot child depends on William dot self. And so do David and Sally uh, files. The second thing is the resolution rule. And this is where you get these horrible magic symbols. But this copy dollar left angle dollar at means that the update rule is you copy the thing on the left to the thing on the right. So I think this, this dollar left bracket, left less than is supposed to say the thing on the left and the dollar at is the thing which you're trying to create. So again, I'm not saying the syntax is particularly brilliant, but, but, it, but it does allow you to, to express generic relationships between files. And then I have to do the same thing for the parent. Dot parent and dot self. Uh, self depends on parent. And to create a self file from a parent, you copy the parent to the self. And then I'll come back to this, but I've got a, a rule called all, which says, which depends on David family and Sally family. And I'll come back to why I've got that there. Then I've got completely explicit rules for David family uh, and, and Sally family, except I have used a, a bit of a trick here. This is something I, that someone only taught me the last time I gave this, 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 um, sem this webinar was that, OK, so this says that David family depends on David parent, David child and David self because it, it, it requires all those files to be listed. So that's the dependency. What's the resolution? Well, in the previous make file, I did ls minus lrt, David parent, David child, David self. But what this is, is, is a short syntax. This says dollar caret means all the things on the right-hand side. And as before, dollar at means, uh, means the thing that you're creating, which is David family. So again, these are slightly cryptic symbols and such like and not particularly self-explanatory but um but uh, they're very useful and once you get to know them or copy an, exa um, an existing example they can allow you to express quite complicated relationships in very simple ways so i'll come back to the own rule and the clean rule later on but let's just look at is everything in order well if you look then the sally isn't the right isn't in the right order because the parent is to go to parent child self, which is wrong, and so does so does stuff. So if I do make, for example, Sally family, it should notice that well, the child was out of date with with respect to the self, and it does that. If I make David family, same thing. Or if I do if I do the thing before, which is for example, I, I make the, the 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 parent completely out of date. That way, so I've now updated Sally dot parent. Look, and Sally dot parent is the youngest of the files, not the oldest. If I do make Sally family, it will unroll the whole level of dependencies. So make it on two things here. As before, it's unrolled the pairwise dependencies between Sally family and the parent child self files between child and self and self and parent. But also nowhere in the make file did I talk about um, did I actually mention um, specifically Sally.parent, Sally.self, it understood what to do simply because it knows generically that a dot child file relationship with the dot self file 
and a, a dot cell file has a relationship with a dot parent file. And so clearly this would, would, would translate to, um, to compilation where you create dot O files from dot C files and such like. So if I go back to the make file, we'll see here uh, that there are, you've seen here that there are kind of, there are three kinds of rules here and I've already covered one of them. One of them is has a dependency and a resolution. So we have two lines, one specifies dependency, one resolution, dependency resolution okay this all has a dependency but no resolution okay what this means is um, that all depends on these the, the, these um, files here David family and, and Sally family but you're gonna have to find out elsewhere how to make them now um, someone asked the, the last time I gave this this seminar uh, this, this webinar does the order of make files matter well Generally, it doesn't, except that if you just type make, I've always previously, in all my examples, I've done make david.child, make Sally family, make Sally.self. If you just type make, make goes down and finds the first explicit rule and applies it to that. So conventionally in make files, we have a rule called all, which specifies everything we want to create. And in, in, in a compilation make file, that would probably be the executable. But here it's David family and Sally family. So if I just type make, so let's let's do that thing where I um if I edit Sally.parent again. If I type make, which is a synonym for make all, it will it will recreate things. So make and make all are synonymous, well nothing to do for all because it's already done it. So that's just a convention. Typically, what we do um, is we stick out an all rule at the top, top, which has a dependency but no resolution, which says, look, if you do make all or just make, I want you to create these things. And by the way, all the other rules are specified elsewhere. The other type of rule is the other way around. We don't have a dependency, but we have a resolution. And this is traditionally used for a clean rule. So because there's no dependency, this is always executed. So if I type make clean, it says, well, that doesn't depend on anything, so I'll always do it. And I'm going to remove all the bits and pieces. So make clean is the standard rule we have in compilation make files to remove all the bits and pieces that are lying around. And here I've said, well, I want to remove the David family and the Sally family. And star twiddle is all the horrible little twiddle files that Emacs insists on leaving, leaving lying around. So if I have a look at what I've got here, you'll see I've got I've got David family, Sally family, and, and Sally dot pet. I've got a twiddle file. If I do make clean it removes those and, and typically in, in a compilation make file we would we would use that to remove um, extraneous files that, that are lying around so um, that's that's really I think all I had to say about this this make file um, it's already starting to get it's quite terse um, and you do so I, I'm not claiming the syntax is fantastic but just to reiterate these are generic rules which say how suffix how files with a certain suffix depend on each other and how they're resolved here with a copy and some magic symbols to say thing on the left thing on the right this is a rule which is always um, if you do make all it says I need to build David family and Sally family but there's no resolution you have to go find it elsewhere this is a normal dependency resolution rule as is this with a few more magic symbols. And this is the other thing where there is no dependency, but there is a resolution. So this is always executed. And it is just convention to have an all rule. So if you type make, then it'll build the most important thing. And clean, which is um, um, which is uh, clean. Now, actually, I, I realized that we're using a new, slightly new version of, of Collaborate here. And I do see the um, notification. Someone asked about make minus J. So, make minus j um, is parallel make so because make understands what depends on what it understands when not only when things depend on each other so if i update the parent and try and make the child it realizes it has to go parent self self child but of course it also recognizes which things are completely independent so but make has inbuilt parallel capabilities because if you do make minus j make minus j4 says run four makes at once spawn four make processes but give them independent tasks and because you specify the dependencies as long as you specify them correctly make can identify all those tasks which are independent and do them in parallel so make minus j4 you know is safe if the make file is correct if um 
if you have an incorrect make file, it might work with the normal make, but not make minus J4 because you may have you may be inadvertently you may have not completely specified the dependencies and just being lucky. But yes, for a correctly written make file, my understanding is that make minus J4 should give you the same answer, but quicker. So that was the good question. So I'll go back to the um, I'll now go back to my um, slides. So I have to do a bit of jiggery pokery again. I've lost my cursor. So we've now shown example two, family two. Um, we've made also and we've explained that now. So now we want to go on to compilation. So um, hopefully that I want to try and explain the concepts of, of dependencies and resolution rules independently of compilation. Now I'll say that actually what people um, often do is they use it for compiling code. So I'm going to go, I have an example I use in a few courses which is about traffic modeling. And what we're going to use, illustrate is the use of variables. So um, in, in my make files before, everything was written out verbatim, file names written out verbatim. You can have variables in make files, which are useful. They're a bit like shell variables. I'll show you how you show dependency on header files. I'll show you how you can um, update C compilers and things. And I'll show you how to um, create lists of variables from other ones. Um, I'll show you how to do, there's some magic variables, which I'll, I think we've covered already, actually. And I've already talked here about default rules and dummy rules, but I'll talk about some other things you can do. So I think it's probably best um, if I just go back, that's a bit of a, a short interlude, to my uh, example and show you the traffic code. So So if I go, I'll do the C1 first, so the, the C serial, it's a C traffic model. And what I'll do is I'll just type make. This is what you would normally do. You just assume the make file is correct, you type make. And it does it does the right thing. It, it, it creates uh, the .o files from the .c files by using the GNU compiler with some debugging options, and then it links them. So these are my pairwise dependencies. And this is the equivalent of my David family, Sally family, which is some kind of linking stage. So this is what you might have seen. Now let's have a look at that make file. And what I've tried to do here is to write a make file, which is actually, um, I should ask Claire if I read, did that resize? Okay, I think it did, didn't it? Yeah, um, which is reasonably generic. So what I've tried to give you is for simple programs, I've tried to give you a make file where Above the line, you put the things which are specific to you, but the below the line, as indicated by no need to edit below this, you shouldn't have to change that stuff. So what I'll do, so now with, this illustrates the use of variables in, in make. MF equals make file is just saying there's a, there's a variable called MF, which I've set to be the string make file. These are string um, settings. I've set CC equals GCC. So I've said there's a thing called CC, a variable called CC, which I've called GCC. There's a variable called C flags, a variable called L flags. There's a variable called the executable. This is multi-line definitions, which just as normal in sort of shell programming or C programming, um, the backslash is just multi-line. So I have a variable called ink, which includes these two files, and a variable called source, which includes these three files. So clearly, I've used, hopefully used sensible names for these. I've said here the make file is called make file. We'll come back to why that's useful later on. I've said the C compiler is called GCC. The C flags are minus G. The linking flags are these. The executable is called traffic. There are two include files, traffic.h and uni.h. And uni.h is actually just to do with a random number generator. And there are three source files, traffic.c, traffic.c, and uni.c. Now, so this is the stuff, you, but then I've tried to give below the line generic rules which basically mean that if that this will be compiled in the way which you would normally expect. So what I've said here now, one of the problems with Make is it has a lot of inbuilt rules and a lot of inbuilt assumptions, a lot of inbuilt defaults. I don't really like those. So what this does, dot suffixes says is forget everything you know about the suffixes. We're going to be concerned with dot c and dot o files. That isn't you wouldn't normally need to do that, but um, but I'm just being paranoid here. But let's look at some of the, the, we've seen this one before, okay, .c .o. This says a .o file depends on a .c file. What do I do to create it if it's out of date? I run the C compiler with the C flags, 
minus C as the standard compiler option says, don't compile an executable, comp compile from a dot C to a dot O. And dollar left-hand thing is the thing on the left-hand side. So for each file, if it sees a dot C file, Fred dot C, it will run this and stick Fred dot C here. So you saw when I did make, this rule was applied to all the three C files. This is my conventional initial all rule. It says all depends on the executable, which I parameterized in a variable. That's saying that if I type make, I want to build the executable. Oh, this is our equivalent of the David family rule. This is how to link. This is how to create all the .o files. This is how to link them together. This says the executable depends on the object files. So the object files, the .o files depend on the C, .c files. The executable depends on the object files and therefore implicitly on the .c files. How do I create that? I run the C compiler with the C flags. I create something at, which you remember is generically and make the target, which here is the executable. I link the object files. This is the string containing all the object files. And I, I have some separate uh, uh, load flags, linker flags in there, which here were, um, and if you saw, I set the, the C flags to minus G and the, the linker flags to minus G minus LM to get the math slider in C. You might think, wait a second, you saying the X's depend on the object files. We haven't defined what the object files are. Well, I could have a variable called obj equals traffic.o, trafficlib.o, and uni.o, but that's wasteful because the I want to, the object and the source file are just the same with different suffixes. And so there's a weird syntax here which says the object string is the same as the source string with all the C's replaced by dot O's. Again, I'm not saying it's a particularly elegant syntax, but it does the job. And just like in shell programming, when you assign a variable, you say cc equals gcc. When you reference it, you have to use a dollar. So this is the value of cc. Um, so I think I've covered everything. My clean rule removes all the object files, the executable, and any core files are lying around. Um, and I'll come back to this one at the end. So uh, the only thing you might, uh, the headers. Here I've said that the object files depend on the include files. That's a paranoid definition. That's that's saying you'll realize here that there's more than one object file on the left and more than one include file on the right. What it's saying is that if this has the effect, if I change any of the include files, it recompiles the entire application. Now that's paranoid. Again, you, you might want to do more uh, um, um, fine level dependencies in your um, um, in your own make files, but this is just a pack. This, this is just a catch all. So what I would do here, let's go. If I do make clean and make, we go back to the start again. Let's say I edit, well, um, graphic.c, for example, the main program, updated. If I do make again, it notices traffic.c needs to be recompiled to, to, to create traffic.o, and then we need to relink these things. If I edit any of the header files, though, for example, like traffic.h, because of my somewhat paranoid definition that everything depends on all the header files, if I remake now, it should recompile everything right from the start. The other thing which is useful in make um, is that you don't have to type, you don't have to um, just rely on, on what people put in the make file. If, for example, I did the same thing again, update the, if I do make again, I'll say nothing needs to be done. If I update the traffic file, but again, I don't have to, I could remake anything. I could say, let make um, uni.o. So what I would expect is it would say, well, uni.o needs to be updated because the header file has changed. And to create uni.o, I need to run the C compiler on uni.c. It just does what I say. If I do, let's, if I do make clean, make uni.o, now make, you see that it noticed that when it did the make, it only had to recompile traffic.c and trafficlib.c, not uni.c because it had already recompiled. So make is quite clever here, as I said, with the correct make file, make will always compile the things that need to be compiled, but never compile things which don't need to be compiled. The other strange, the one strange thing you might wonder is, why have I said the executable, it's somewhere here generically, the executable depends on, sorry, the object depends on the make file here. That's because you might want to do something like, um, well, I might want to comply with optimization now. I don't want to comply with debug, I want to do minus 03. I've now changed the make file. And in my view, when the make file is changed, all bets are off. 
So what that dollar obj depends on the make file says is if ever I update the make file, we have to recompile from scratch. And that's a very useful rule to have. If I do make now, it will notice he updated the make file. I'll need to recompile from scratch. So that's, that's, that's again, maybe want to look at these things offline, but hopefully um, that illustrates, I'm just looking at my crib sheet here. Um, yes. Um, uh, that, 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 that illustrates the way that make files work. So if I go back to the presentation, Um, okay, um, I'll come back to the Fortran version. Um, I'll just go back to that later. It's slightly complicated because of the use of modules. Um, but I try to illustrate it's possible to create relatively simple generic make files and you can extend as appropriate for real cases. So for simple programs, hopefully these make files will, 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 will be um, useful templates for you. Um, either to understand how make works or to use for your own um, for your own uh, devices. Just a few things I wanted to cover. As I said, makes far from uh, far from perfect. The dirty linen tabs have magic significantly make files. This is horrific and horrible and breaks every rule of Unix, which is the white space is white space white space. So you so if you ever looked at my make files and there was a big indentation there, that is a tab. That has magic significance. You can't easily cut and paste makes files from the web because if you do cut and paste, you get eight spaces, not a tab. On Archer, GNU spots this. If I if I accidentally had eight spaces instead of a tab, I do make David Child. It says missing separator. Did you mean tab instead of eight spaces? Well, why it didn't? There, there must be someone who knows more about formal languages than me can, can explain, but the, the way that make is defined, there must be some reason to have to have a tab. Uh, but it, it's the classic, it's the classic error in make. And it's, it's horrible and you can't see it from the screen. But if you get really, really, really weird error messages, it probably means that your dependency, it's the resolution rules, which have to be indented by a tab, not eight spaces. So that is quite nasty. Tricks and tips, I've, I've um, shown you this. You can make anything under control of make, makefile.o will create that. Make minor end prints out what make would do without doing it. So that's quite useful. If you're worried that something's going to go wrong, you can do make minus n and it prints out what it would do. Make minus minus debug prints out why it's doing. And that's very useful. And also you can actually, if you want to do debugging, you can actually put extra rules into the make file. So I'll, I'll illustrate the make minus n, make debug and the extra rules with a little example in the C file. So let's go back. Oh. Reshare the file. Okay. So if I if I do, for example, um, if I touch, if I uh, if I update, for example, um, again, you need dot c. Well, obviously traffic dot c. Uh, that could be yes. That's a could be true. That could be true. Um, so if I do make minus n, it says this is actually this is saying what would I do if so if I do make minus n, I'll do the same thing. Okay, whoops, sorry, sorry, make minus n. I've just screwed up. So make minus n. Uh, this is saying what I would do if I ran make. It's not actually doing it. If I do make minus minus debug, you'll see it's fairly verbose, but you'll see it's quite nice. It says file all does not exist. So so when I do make, it goes to look at the first, which is all. It says updating goal targets, which means, well, I, I have to go and um, look at everything else. pre traffic traffic.c is newer than traffic.o. Oh, I have to must remake traffic.o, oh, and, and then it successfully makes it. And then traffic oh, is newer than traffic, must remake target traffic, and it does it all. Okay. So, so actually, make minus minus debug is quite useful, especially when your make files aren't, aren't working to find out what's going on. The thing I wanted to know about putting in the, your own rules is, example. There's this slightly weird syntax here which says obj. Imagine you didn't understand. You might say, I don't understand what that means. What is this obj variable? I could just have a rule which was print obj and I could echo obj is dollar. You can put any shell command, any bash command in there. So if I do make print obj 
it will say obvious that so that's useful you you can play around one of my concerns about the way that people deal with makers make file make files are seen as these sacred documents that should never be touched but you know you need to get in there and try and understand them and you can play around with them and, and add to your own debug statements you might ask and this is something i've not tried in the rehearsal so it may go wrong but you might ask okay You've got your generic rule, which is to compile compile with minus g, which is a debug flag. But I want to compile one of my one of my um, programs with high optimization. Not all, because that's too expensive, but just one of them. I think if I put an explicit rule here, that will override these generic rules. So I could do something like traffic dot o depends on traffic dot c. Okay, then my magic um, tab. CC, not the C flags, but explicitly minus O3 minus C dollar at. So I think this, I think that this explicit rule will override this generic rule, so that um, the or most of the files will be compiled with the not this normal C flags, but traffic dot O will be compiled with minus O3. Now, I didn't try this in rehearsal, so let's see if it works. Make clean make, uh, and I screwed it up because I have put it above the all rule. Okay, there we go, that was, okay. So I need, need to be below the all rule. The problem was when I did make it, it only made traffic dot O. Um, so that was, let's do make clean again and make, yes. So we see here that it works, that the, the explicit rule for traffic dot C overrode, overrode the generic rule for the other ones. So you often see make files which are effectively have complete, uh, completely explicit. They're written out completely verbatim, and that's really wasteful. You want to have generic rules to cope for the majority of cases, and to specialize every now and again with, with a specific rule for, um, for 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 the kind of um, uh, out of band, the unusual cases. Um, I've got a four trying. Um, I won't go in, in detail here, but if we look, I'll just if I type make. It compiles correctly. Um, um, if I look at the make file, it's very similar. I've actually made a slight mistake in there because I've actually. Um, okay, fine. Um, this is very similar. I've just got the same definitions for the few. Uh, but there is an issue in Fortran. Um, the equivalent of header files in Fortran are module files. And the important point is that module files are created by the compiler, whereas headed files are created, um, created by the programmer. And so in Fortran, source files can depend on each other because a source file may use a module defined in another source file. The ramifications of that is that Fortran codes have to be compiled in the right order. For a standard C code, it doesn't matter what order you compile the C files in. For a Fortran code, it does because you have to compile the files which define the modules before you compile the files that use the modules. So that means that Fortran make files require extra dependencies. So I've had to put one in here. Traffic lib uses the, the random number generator to have to say traffic lib.o depends on unirand.o and traffic uses a module from traffic lib. And so the, I should put a comment in here saying why they're there. But that's the way that you um, that's the way that you uh, in, encapsulate um, how you can try and put modules in uh, module dependencies into Fortran make files is to put the correct dependencies between the .o files. Um, so unfortunately, because Fortran has a slightly more sophisticated structure than C, um, that can be a bit of an issue. I've slightly run over, so I'll go back and I'll just give my summary slides. Um, So I've covered these things, make minus n, make debug, and, and you can put debug rules in. Complications, Fortran modules, more specifically the C header bars, but harder to cope with. Um, oh, um, okay, I've done the wrong, thank you. So Claire has bought it out because I didn't click share. Okay. Thanks, thanks Claire. Um, what if I have hundreds of header files? Well, there are tools, things called make depend, which will write the rules for you. There are tools which will look at all your source. You say, well, I want to make sure that I have a dependency that every .c file depends on the .h file if the C file includes the .h file. Make depend will go and scrape all your source files and write that. You may be more used to be doing, um, uh, you know, um, inst um, 
configure, make, make, install. The GNU Auto tools produce make files. Unfortunately, they're so monstrous and generic and verb, not human understandable. So the GNU Auto tools like configure, you know, configure, make, make, install are fundamentally configure produces a make file and make just runs make on the make file. Unfortunately, that make file is, is auto generated and in my opinion, not human readable. But just to let you know, GNU Auto Tools is just a layer on top of Make. Make has many implicit default rules and variables, but I tend not to use, I try not to use these. So for example, Make, if, 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 if it sees a .c file, it kind of guesses it should run the GNU compiler on it. If it, Various variables like CC and C flags have magic significance but I, I don't like to depend on them so my make files may look a bit um, pedantic but that's because I try to make them um, explicit and, and verbose. Uh, one other complication on Archer specifically there are two problems here one is um, actually so based um, we in my make files for sharpen for traffic.c and traffic.f night for the traffic files, if I had wanted to change the compiler from GCC to Intel C compiler, I would have had to update the make file. I would have said CC equals ICC instead of CC equals GCC. The data of the make file would have changed. Make would have would have recognized that and recompiled everything. Unfortunately, on Archer, the compilers are always called CC and FTN. And what they point to um, is dependent on the, the module. So if you do module switch prog env cray and proc to prog env intel, if you type make, nothing will happen because according to make, nothing has changed. So you need to do make clean make by hand. That's because unfortunately these compiler changes are invisible to, um, to make. The second problem is you might say, well, it's all very good on Archer. The C compiler always be called in CC regardless of whether it points to GCC, ICC or cray CC. But we all know that the Explicit compilers take different options from from each other. So how can I have a make file which makes in all works in all situations? Well, make files can inquire on the values of um, environment variables, and there's a magic environment variable called cray underscore prog env cray. So if you say you can inquire on whether cray pro, if if cray prog env cray equals loaded, then the C flags are the the the, the, the uh, C flags appropriate for the Cray compiler if Cray underscore prog and GNU is loaded. So that it's a bit more complicated, but you can inquire from within the make file what the programming environment is and set any compiler flags um, appropriately. So the definition of the compiler flags will change, but the actual um, make file itself will still just run. The, 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 you shouldn't have to change the details of the make file. Uh, the final thing is, I'll just make a comment on the final. A lot of people get into the habit, I see them, that their standard way of building a program is make, clean, make. They then edit a file, then they do make, clean, make. The whole point about make is it's supposed to compile the minimum of files. So with a correctly written make file, you don't have to, and other than exceptional circumstances, like a change in environment, which is invisible to make, in normal edit, compile, run cycle, when you edit a file, when it's updated, you should just have to type make, and make will just update those things which are which are necessary. Obviously, if things go completely pear-shaped and you get completely confused, make clean is a very good way of getting back to square one. But if your make file is correct, your standard mode of operation should be edit, make, run, not edit, make, clean, make, run. Some people seem to have gotten into this habit. I've seen of doing make clean every time, and that should only be, that, that's only necessary if you have a buggy make file. Uh, maybe you do, but in that case, you should fix your make file, not um, recompile everything every time. So that's the end. Um, I've overrun by about 10 minutes. Apologies for that. But I'm more than welcome to take um, take questions um, anyone has in chat. Um, oh, yes. So. In, so I guess the OT browser, I was just, I was just wondering if you could expand briefly on includes in make files. So is that where, do you mean include files as in C.h files or make files including other, other make files? Yeah, so, so, so there's a standard problem here that you might have, you might say um, you want to have a block of code which defines 
the C compiler, the C flags, and you know they're different on different platforms. So you'd want to, you know, in, uh, you might have, you know, um, so it's just a textual include, just like a hash include in in um, in C, but it allows you to say if you have a whole block of definitions relevant to the Cray, whole block of definitions re definitions relevant to your laptop, you can do include, um, you know. Uh, rules dot um, dot cray or include rules dot laptop and just comment them. Oh, a comment. I didn't say it's a comment in um, make is a make file is the standard hash. It's fairly common. So that's that's the way it works. Now they can get very complicated and recursive and such like, but that is the standard way of having a completely generic top level make file and then a number of other files which specify the explicits and um, if there's if there's more than one thing to be changed between different compilers, sticking all those together in the same in a, in a rules dot cray rules dot laptop file is a more elegant way of doing it. But my understanding is it's just a hash. It's just a textual hash include. It's just a way of constructing it more generically and elegantly. So it would allow you to only yeah yeah it would allow you to say I don't want to have to edit this horrible make file with thousands of lines. I have a make flag that I just edit that. But it is just the same as doing it in line, but it's more elegant. So just to say, actually, I learned a lot putting this together because uh, I'd only ever written make files for compilation before. And creating this generic parent child self make file that sounds simple um, made me realize I was relying on a lot more on linking libraries. OK, uh, so yeah, Oliver, do you mean linking libraries into an application or, um, or creating a library? From within the make file, Are you, I, I, so that using the make file to link in external libraries or creating libraries from within a make file. Yeah, so you should. I mean, you should. If I look at, if I share my example, if I wanted to to link in some external library, I could just say some. You know, I would say lib libs equals slash user slash local use lib magic lib.a and I should just be able to um, in my link rule possibly where is it here uh, dollar I uh, know dollar libs minus L dollar libs I guess um, yeah so if I do it now do make it will well of course it didn't find it but at least it did the right thing GCC minus G minus L and user lib magic lib dot. It's that kind of, I mean, um, it's more complicated if you're, if you're constructing the libraries from within the make file because then that, that comes a bit more tricky. But linking an external libraries, um, ah, well, again, uh, on the Cray, um, that will, on the Cray, you at least shouldn't have to specify explicit paths because the modules environment will but that's the kind of the way you do it i mean i don't know if that helps but you know that's what i would do i would have some line which said which my libraries and then i can just include that explicitly on the link line down here as, as and to include it um um is that i don't know if that's quite what you meant but i mean the only thing about external libraries is again you have to be careful that if they change, you know, if external libraries have changed, you want to do a make clean make because you don't have control over them. So that would be, a, you know, someone says, you know, the the the, the Petsy or the Skalapak library has changed. You would want to do a, you would well, you'd need to relink. Probably best to recompile as well, just for for safety. Okay, if there's no more questions, then um, that's the the end. So thanks everyone. Thanks for your questions and um, goodbye.